Good morning. Well, it has been a long, long time since uh, <laughs> I was supposed to do this yesterday, about the longest uh, 18 or 20 hours of my recent life. Uh, <laughs> but we're here, and I think, uh, I think we're in business. Um, big, big thanks to Doug over here with the camera. Please, a hand for him. <laughs> we, we had to, to rebuild this PowerPoint slide by slide, sound file by sound file, and I think it's going to work. <laughs> so, um, starting here, I don't know how many people have ever read Berlin Diary. Um, this was a bestseller during the war. Shirer was an American journalist who lived in Berlin for several years, kept a diary which he published in uh, 42, when, by which time we were in the war. And um, this is from the very end of it. He's out of Germany, not without some trouble. Uh, he's made it to Portugal, and from Portugal, he'll return to the United States. And th these are his reflections, uh, leaving Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal in 1940. A full moon was out over the Tagus, and all the million lights of Lisbon and more across the broad river on the hills sparkled brightly as the ship slid down to sea. For how long? Beyond Lisbon, over almost all of Europe, the lights were out. This little fringe on the southwest corner of the continent kept them burning. Civilization, such as it was, had not yet been stamped out here by a Nazi boot. But next week, the month after, next year, would not Hitler's hordes take this too and extinguish the last lights? And I thought of this quote when I was working on, on the preparation of this presentation uh, because you get a lot of songs that involve light during the war years. And one that was a hit early in the war was called When the Lights Go On Again All Over the World. And I have it on a, a pretty good CD called uh, Songs That Got Us Through World War II. But the notes, um, the notes are a little, come up a little short and it just says, oh, well, this is a reference to the air raids because uh, had, everybody had to turn out the lights at night. And, well, that's true as far as it goes, but I'm going to play a clip of the song, and really, you know, light was being used, the image of light was being used symbolically. So here's Vaughn Monroe from 1942, when the lights go on again all over the world. Okay, so that's 1942, and really I'm here to talk about 1945, so we're going to fast forward to April 1945. On April 12th, which was a Thursday, uh, in the late afternoon, uh, FDR died. This was the only president that many soldiers and many Americans could really remember. If you were 18 or 19 in 1945, you might just barely remember Herbert Hoover, but really, Roosevelt had been the only president, and with victory in sight, he died. And the uh, body was loaded onto a train. He was in Warm Springs, Georgia, and taken to Atlanta, and from Atlanta on up the coast to Washington, D.C. 
and it was a steam train, had to stop several times to take on water and coal, and every stop that it made, the stations were swarmed with people who wanted to see FDR one more time. And all along the route where it didn't stop, people would get up on hills and high ground hoping to get a glimpse of the train as it passed by. It arrived Saturday morning, April 14th, in Washington, D.C., Union Station, and this was broadcast nationally. And I should say that from the moment that FDR's death was announced on Thursday afternoon, NBC and CBS both decided that they would stay on the air 24 hours with no commercials until he was buried. And this they did until Sunday evening, April 15th. They were uh, calling in tributes and commentary from all over the world. They had been rehearsing, actually, for VE Day, and they were already calling it VE Day, even though it hadn't happened yet. And so they had, you know, links were in place to Europe, to the South Pacific, all over, and tributes would pour in. So when the body reached Union Station uh, on the morning of April 14th, the uh, networks had their commentators, their reporters, lined up along the route, most of them actually on the top of buildings along the route. And CBS had a team of uh, five or six reporters, I believe, and the uh, last one to, uh, last one along the route before it reached the White House was a local radio personality named Arthur Godfrey, who very shortly would become nationally known um, and, in fact, almost iconic. But at this time, he was a local radio personality for a CBS affiliate. CBS asked him to join the broadcast team because he had so much experience covering things like inauguration parades and other events, and he knew Washington so well. And I'm going to play two excerpts of Godfrey's commentary. He was on mic for about 25 minutes describing everything that he saw and sharing his recollections because he was, uh, had an, he was acquainted with FDR. He had covered his uh, first inauguration in 1933. And you'll hear it becomes a more and more emotional thing for him to the point where he has to sign off. And this was heard nationally by, by tens of millions of people. So here from early on, I'll, I'll say one more thing, which is a couple of years ago, History Channel did a big documentary on FDR, uh, which was good. And when they covered his funeral, they had a lot of newsreel footage. Uh, but they didn't have any sound for it. So they dubbed in, so that it would have a soundtrack, they dubbed in Amazing Grace played on the bagpipes. Uh, let me tell you, there wasn't a bagpipe in sight. <laughs> That's not what people there heard. What they heard was a um, uh, military uh, brass band playing music appropriate to the occasion, and the pieces were separated by the sound of the muffled drums. Delano Roosevelt takes 